Okay, hello and welcome to the final Loom lesson of this second week back after Easter. This lesson is still in B18, it's the third one, it's about polluting the lab. In the previous lesson, we looked at polluting the air and polluting water. So these were things like acid rain, uh, eutrophication. You'll see these in the do now. As well as that, in lesson one, we looked at the human population and its effect on biodiversity. If you have not completed these two lessons already, please go and do so before moving on to this third and final lesson for this week. So here is our do now. Please pause the video now and complete the do now. On to the answers. I think it's all fairly self-explanatory here. Number four, it's come up again, crops. Use of glucose, this one will be in quite a big thing, it's important. Number seven, it's great if you can stretch yourself. Why is leaves falling off trees an issue? Well, the trees, the leaves absorb sunlight, which is needed for photosynthesis. For six, I've made a clear mistake now. I've said photosynthesis is, the type of reaction that photosynthesis is, is photosynthesis. However, I think we all know the correct answer should be endothermic. I like to pretend I did that on purpose, but that's no, just an honest mistake. All right, if it's endothermic, what does that mean? It takes energy in. Okay, so we're looking at land pollution today. This starts with kind of just uh, look at recycling versus not recycling. So when we put things in the recycling box, what do we think happens? What happens to things you don't put in the recycling box? Well, nearly all the food that we purchase is packaged up. That could be beans, that could be um, pasta, that could be pizza, and tell my extensive diet now, that could be kebab. So, just interested, as a ballpark figure, how much packaging do you think the average family throws away per year. Half a ton of packaging. That is an incredibly large amount. Now, this is a big problem, and that's due to where all this waste ends up. All of our waste, if not recycled, ends up in landfill. Okay, it ends up in a place known as landfill. It's not actually places, what that place is called. So it ends up in landfill. So the question is, why is throwing away so much waste a problem? And the answer is, really, because it all ends up in a landfill. So, and I like this picture, actually. It says, don't throw anything away, there is no way. And that's so true. The waste that we chuck into landfill will sit there. It will start to grow and well, not grow literally, but it will build up in that landfill more and more until we have to use more and more space for landfill. That waste will not go away anytime soon. We are now going to take a bit of a jump to a, something known as bioaccumulation. I want you to imagine you are a farmer, you grow wheat. There's a picture of wheat in case you're unsure. I've also put an example food chain below. What could you do to increase the amount of wheat you grow? You can't uh, take over more land. You'll start with the land you've got here. What could you do to increase the amount of wheat that you grow for you to sell? Okay, very thing you can do, you can kill those moths, okay? You can kill what eats your wheat. So to do that, we can use something known as pesticides. Pesticides are chemicals that we can spray onto crops to kill pests, hence why they're called pesticides. So two questions I want you to write, jot down the answers to. Number uno, what is a pesticide? Number two, if a pesticide kills pests, what do insecticides do? What do herbicides do? What do spermicides do? And what do fungicides do? Okay, please jot the answers down now. I will then take you through the answers. So a pesticide, it's directly above, they're chemicals that kill pests. Insecticides will kill insects. Herbicides kill herbs, plants. Spermicides kill sperm. Fungicides kill fungi. 
Okay. So, if this pesticide kills the moth, what effect will that have on the food chains? Is that what you to be thinking about now? Or you to have an answer verbally ready? So, what happens to the food chain? Okay, so I've killed that moth. That will lead to an increase in wheat, but also a decrease in birds. These birds rely on these moths for food. This is a particular problem in areas of low biodiversity. Good link to lesson one there, sir. So the moths die out will have an effect on the rest of that food chain. So this pesticide, do you think it solely kills moths? It's not a mothicide. So is all that pesticide kills moths? If no, why is that an issue? Pesticides will also kill other insects. That could be things like ladybirds. That could be things like bees. These insects are important because they are pollinators. An issue with using pesticide is it can also kill pollinators. These pollinators are needed for the plants to reproduce and therefore more of them to grow. That was a very good animation, I know. So we're going to look at this in a kind of larger one now as well. We have looked at the effects of pesticides. So, for example, their effect on the food chain. We've also looked at their effect on other insects because they're indiscriminate. You may want to just kill moths, but you also end up killing pollinators like bees and ladybirds. We're going to look at a bigger effect now, and this is what bioaccumulation is all about. So I'm a farmer. I spray my pesticides onto my crops. That pesticide gets into my 16 small plants. After that, the eight little itty bitty animals eat the plants. So my pesticide moves up the food chain. After that, my four little animals, maybe my four little, my eight little dragonflies, sorry, are killed by four fish. The pesticide once again moves up the food chain. This is what bioaccumulation is. It's the movement of a dangerous chemical like pesticide up the food chain or along the food chain. Two eels then eat the fish, the pesticide moves up, one otter eats the eels, the pesticide moves up into the otters. Now this can be particularly dangerous because for example, say I showed you a different food chain here that ends with for example cows, after that you'd have humans that would eat the cows and that pesticide could therefore move up into humans. This is why we particularly care about bioaccumulation. So this was actually a real example of the use of DDT, which was used as a method to control pests. It actually had a very large effect on other animals such as otters. And that was due to the bioaccumulation of this toxic chemical. It would move up the food chain as the organisms below were eaten. So, certain questions now. Number one, where does most of the rubbish that we produce end up? How can we reduce the amount of rubbish that ends up here? And number three, what is the process of bioaccumulation? And explain why it can kill organisms further up a food chain. So, pause the video now and complete the questions. So answer number one, most of rubbish ends up in a landfill. How can we reduce the amount of rubbish that ends up there? Well, hopefully you put recycle, but you can also reduce and reuse. The three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Reduce means, as the name suggests, you use less of a product. You reuse it. So you might reuse uh, your water bottles, your coffee cups from Starbucks. Recycle. Yes, recycling plants, you can drop off metal, you can drop off old clothes, um, cardboard, paper, these can all be recycled. Okay, describing the process of bioaccumulation and explain why it can kill organisms and hyper food chain. Now there's a long answer here. The really key part that I want you to write down and take away is that bioaccumulation is when toxic chemicals like pesticides move up a food chain. As they move up the food chain, they concentrate 
in the organisms and therefore kill them. If you need to watch that again to write it down, please rewind the video to go to the correct place. Okay, we're going to end with Badham's 15. There's eight questions here. I want you to pause the video, get your answers down. I'm then going to take you through the answers. So here's your first eight questions. On to your last seven to take you to the Badham's 15. Please record your answers to these 15 questions. For number five or number 12, describe eutrophication, I will take either a picture or, or a verbal written, sorry, description. Okay, pause the video now. I'm going to go back to the first slide and start going through the answers when you're ready. So, let's go through this quick as can. Number one, where does aerobic respiration take place? Aerobic respiration takes place in the mitochondria. Anaerobic respiration, number two, occurs in the cytoplasm. Where does photosynthesis take place? Photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. If a reaction is exothermic, that means it releases energy. The symbol for glucose, capital C, little six, capital H, little 12, O6, C6, H12O6. The word equation for anaerobic respiration in animals is anaerobic respiration. Glucose, arrow, lactic acid. If you've got plus energy, that's fine, but you don't have to have it. Glucose, arrow, lactic acid. Number seven. One difference is that anaerobic respiration occurs in the cytoplasm, whereas aerobic respiration occurs in the mitochondria. There are many more differences you can have. Uh, anaerobic respiration is without oxygen, whereas aerobic respiration requires oxygen. Just an example of another one. So number eight, a similarity between the two of them. They both require glucose. They are both exothermic. They both release energy. However, obviously, you have to be aware that aerobic respiration releases more energy. Number nine. What two gases cause acid rain? Nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide. Nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide. Number two, suggest a pH that acid rain could have. Anything from five and below. So anything below five, really. Five, 4.7, 4.6, 4.8, 4. .7, 4, .6, 4 .8, 4. Um, that'd be where I would go. Number three, give the name and formula of any acid. So the name part's really easy. So the names you could have, Hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, or nitric acid. So for the formulas, if you went for sulfuric acid, it should be H2SO4. For hydrochloric acid, a simple HCl. For nitric acid, HNO3. If a reaction is endothermic, that means it absorbs energy, it takes energy in. An example of this type of reaction is photosynthesis. Okay, we're gonna come back to describe eutrophication. What changes take place in your body when you exercise? Your heart beats faster. Therefore, more oxygen is transported around your body. Therefore, more aerobic respiration can occur. Therefore, more energy is released. You don't need all of that for the answer for this. I'm just reminding you. You breathe deeper, you breathe faster, your temperature increases, you sweat more. Number 12, 15 even, not 12, number 15 slash 7 here. The human population has increased because less people are dying. There's a larger birth rate than death rate. Better medicines now and more food. Okay, on to describe eutrophication. We've got my great picture. I will be showing you an example of that picture in a moment. Okay, on to describe eutrophication. Now, it's a really long one. You could have done a great picture as well. That would be fine. So your farmers release fertilizers. That contains nitrates. It leaches into the lakes and rivers. It's a long answer. Please do get it all down. This causes algal bloom. 
this algal bloom means or well, it's a layer of algae atop the lake or river it means sunlight cannot penetrate down to the depths of that lake that means plants at the bottom cannot get enough light therefore they cannot photosynthesize photosynthesize this means they die leads to a lack of oxygen this causes fish to die okay that is the end of today's lesson and the end of this week's lesson well done for making it all the way through it is so important we had a fantastic turnout last week and it's so important that we keep this going once again if you've got any suggestions please do just get in touch if not stay safe look after yourselves and see you all soon